everything is going to hell down here in Texas. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. This is episode number 220 freaking eight. This is your boy, Rob Clark, Big Bad Bob with you for another exciting episode of the Lone Gunman Podcast. That's right. I love this music. You get me so fired up. Thank you again, Roger and Shepard on Fire for the music that you hear during this show. It comes straight from them. It's freaking awesome. It gets my blood moving. It's my veins throbbing. Love it. So thank you again. Shepherd on fire. My buddy Roger. You're the man. I freaking love it. So on this episode, folks, 228. Huh. Get out your Kleenex. Get out your tissues. Uh, it's going to be a very emotional episode. I promise. Oh, we're going to first talk a little bit about uh, missing anti-Castro CIA pilot Alex Rourke, Alexander Rourke. And uh, let's see, after that, we're going to get into a little bit about the mob, the mafia. Giancana, Mayhew, Roselli, all kinds of good shit that I tell you. I promise you, stick around. It's going to be a good one. So let's first talk about Alexander Rourke. Now, for those of you not familiar with the Alexander Rourke case, um, he was involved in covert anti caster missions for the CIA. And in 1961, he met Jeffrey Sullivan, who was a commercial pilot who he hired to help with these missions. Later that same year, the unsuccessful Bay of Pigs invasion occurred. And after that, the CIA began conducting their missions much more secretly. And these were the missions that Jeffrey and Alex were involved in. However, the U.S. government soon released a public warning issuing people like Jeffrey and Alex to stop their anti-Cuba operations. Eight days after this warning was issued, on September the 23rd, 1963, Jeffrey and Alex left an airstrip in Waterbury, Connecticut. Before they left, Jeffrey told his wife that this would be his last flight because he was going to stop being involved in this shit. The next day, they arrived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where they met two men. One was Frank Sturgis, who you may have heard of, folks, who would later become involved in the Watergate burglar scandal. Sturgis said that Alex told him that he had a B-25 bomber and that he was planning to take it to Nicaragua, which would become a base of operations for bombing missions into Cuba. Work soon rented an airplane, and the next day his wife picked up an unidentified man and took the five men to the local airport. Jeffrey, Alex, and the mystery man boarded the rented plane while Sturgis, his companion, and Alex's wife stayed behind. For unknown reasons, the plane returned to Fort Lauderdale at least three times. The last time, the landing gear remained up, and the controller instructed them not to land. Five hours later, they landed at North Perry Airport, which was only 30 minutes away. Now, at 1.30 p.m. that day, the plane left again scheduled to land in Honduras. However, two hours later, Jeffrey radioed Miami International Airport and told them that he was rerouting to Panama. And finally, 
At 10.22 p.m., Jeffrey said that he was once again rerouting the plane, this time to Belize. The FAA stated that Jeffrey refueled the plane in Cozumel, Mexico, around midnight, and this was the last sighting of the plane. Despite a massive search, neither the plane nor the occupants were ever found. Over two decades later, Jeffrey's daughter Sherry, now a private investigator, began to search for her father's fate. She and her lawyer petitioned the government for information about Jeffrey. More than a third of the papers that she received from the FBI were censored. In the FBI documents, she found the name of Floyd Park. She contacted Floyd, and he claimed that he had seen Jeffrey, Alex, and the unidentified man in Belize two days after they were last seen. However, she was able to get little other information from Floyd, and she is uncertain of his true identity or his connection to her father. The only other information she got from Floyd is that Jeffrey and Alex may have been taken prisoner in Cuba, and that Fidel Castro was aware of their operations and, placed, and had placed a bounty on the two men's heads. In 1986, Sherry came in contact with Marty Casey, a journalist who was in Cuba in 1965. While in Cuba, a Cuban exile told him that he knew two men from the United States, one he called Rourke and the other Sullivan. The man said that he was with them in a Cuban prison in 1963, around the time that they had vanished. She believes that the ones in prison were her father and Alex. Another name that she found in the FBI documents was Enrique Molina Garcia. Garcia was supposedly a double agent for Castro's government. She believes that Garcia was the mysterious, unidentified man that flew with them when they vanished. She believes that Garcia tricked them into flying to Cuba, where they were then captured. Unconfirmed reports placed Garcia in Havana, Cuba, several years after Jeffrey and Alex had vanished. She will not give up until she finds out what truly happened to her father and Alex. Enrique Molina Garcia is suspected of tricking Jeffrey and Alex into flying to Cuba. Sherry believes that they were held prisoner there for several years. Floyd Park is another man that she would like to identify and locate. Um, the case first aired on December 19, 1990 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. As of August 2009, a main court found Cuba guilty of the wrongful death of Jeffrey Sullivan. Sherry believes now that he was shot down by the Cubans, taken prisoner, tortured for a decade, and finally executed. However, in 2012, a federal court reversed the decision. He is continuing to fight to get the case back in court and hopes to recover his remains one day. Neither Jeffrey nor Alex have ever been found. So that is a little bit of background on uh, Alex Rourke and Jeffrey Sullivan. Uh, a little more on Alexander Rourke uh, specifically. Uh, we head over to uh, Christopher Othen's WordPress site. Where he writes that on September the 24th, 1963, Alexander Irwin Rourke Jr. climbed into a twin-engine plane at Fort Lauderdale Airport and was never seen again. The good-looking 37-year-old with black hair and blue eyes was a well-known figure in the murky world of Florida anti-communism. He had been a freelance photojournalist in Cuba covering Fidel Castro's revolution until critical comments about the new regime's leftward drift got him in trouble. Some jail time and a deportation order later, he was up to his neck in CIA agents, right-wing Cuban exiles, soldiers of fortune, and ultra-conservative American patriotism. In 1961, he scattered anti-Castro leaflets all over Havana by airplane. The next year, his secret boat trips to Cuba for guerrilla warfare. Early in 63, he was back in the air bombing a Cuban oil refinery. FBI agents warned him off, but Rourke ignored them. Now he had another mission. When Rourke failed to return, his hysterical wife, 
called her father. Now, Sherman Billingsley was a 67-year-old nightclub owner who never really liked his son-in-law. He wouldn't even allow him in the damn house. And when Jacqueline brought little Alex the third by for visits, Alex Rourke had to wait outside the mansion in the car. Billingsley had convinced himself that marriage to a slick charmer was just a bit of rebellion by his favorite daughter. Her sobbing voice on the telephone finally convinced him otherwise. Oh my God, you really loved him, said Sherman, Sherman Billingsley in surprise. He reached out to his contacts, and Billingsley was a very influential man. He was the owner of the Stork Club, an exclusive night spot for the rich and famous. Ernest Hemingway, Orson Welles, Ethel Merman, all had been regulars. These days, the club was on the slide, but Billingsley still had important friends, and most of them prepared uh, to overlook stories of his youthful bootlegging adventures and he asked the FBI for help. But he wasn't the only one to ask the FBI for help. Folks, get out your tissues. Get out your tissues. This is going to be a rough one. I am going to attempt to recreate the voice of this young lady. Hold on for a second. Let me see if this works. Hi. Do I sound like a little girl or a little boy? I kind of sound like a little boy. Let me see if I can make it sound more like a little girl. Hold on. Oh. Hello. 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 Um... Um, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, well, I guess it is a little boy that you will be getting, but actually, 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 it's a little girl, okay? January 22nd, 1967. Dear President Johnson, to be honest with you, in my heart, I believe you could tell us what happened to my daddy. Every time I say my prayers, I have a feeling he is alive. And I ask God to bring him back to us. His name is Alexander L. Rourke Jr. And he has been missing for three whole years in three dreadful months. My mama's father died about three months ago. My grandpa, Alexander L. Rourke Sr., is very sick and we know he can't live much longer. I imagine. If something happened to you and your daughter tried to find out what happened to you, how would you feel? Last time I wrote you, but I received a nice letter from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover. I think many people know what happened to him, but I have a funny feeling you are the only one who is in a position to tell us. Please tell me. I want my father, and if you would, it would mean so much to my grandpa. Respectfully yours, Hazel Rourke. Okay, okay, folks, I'm back. <laughs> wow. My damn. Thank you, Hazel. Oh. Now, Johnson didn't answer her course because he's too much of a piece of shit but uh j edgar hoover did now he's a piece of shit too but at least he answered this poor girl okay dear miss hazel rook 
Your letter to President Johnson concerning your missing father, Alexander L. Rourke Jr., has been referred to me. I received the letter on February 3rd, 1967, and today is February the 7th, 1967. I regret to tell you that we have received no information as to the whereabouts of your father. The missing person notice is, of course, being continued in our identification files, and you may be sure that any information we do receive will be forwarded immediately to you. As I have pointed out to you and to Mr. William H. Rourke Sr., we do not have the authority to conduct an active investigation to locate your father. Sorry. Sincerely, J. Edgar Hoover. Now there's a note on the bottom of this uh, letter that I don't believe was sent as part of the letter to Hazel. But it says, note, MP ident Alexander Irwin Work Jr., FBI, number 509-11, view file, blah, 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 clerical employee of New York office, 1951, from February of 1951 to May of 1951. Resigned to resume studies. Became soldier of fortune, anti-Castro photographer, newspaper man. Disappeared September 63 with his pilot, allegedly bound for Honduras, but presumed to have died in a bombing raid over Cuba. Torres, apparently 10 years old, when last letter was acknowledged on 6-15-64. Hills omitted from address, according to zip code direct, blah, blah, blah. So the FBI pretty much thinks that he was killed in a bombing raid over Cuba, but didn't tell young Hazel that. So on January 31st, uh, we have this FBI memorandum. On Friday, January 28, 1966, Richard Berlin, president of the Hearst Corporation. Now, that's the big newspaper conglomerate, folks, who is well known to the director, J. Edgar Hoover, and the Bureau, telephonically contacted Mr. Cartha Deloach. Mr. Berlin advised that he had a very pathetic letter from Mrs. Alexandria L. Rourke Jr., known as Hazel, who was formerly Jacqueline, no, I'm sorry, not Hazel, who was formerly Jacqueline Billingsley, the daughter of Sherman Billingsley. In her letter to Berlin, Mrs. Work stated that she was desperate and asked Berlin if he could be of any assistance in helping her locate her husband. Berlin, in turn, advised Mr. Deloach that he would be most appreciative of any information we could give him regarding Rourke, which might be of possible assistance to Mrs. Rourke. All right, and so he tells them, this is the, all the information we have in our bureau files. He worked for us for three months in 1951, at which time he resigned to pursue further education. Da, da, da. At one time, he was being counseled by the CIA. However, that agency informed on June 25th, 62, that it had no operational interest in work considering to be too much of a, quote, loose talker. In April of 63, Wark publicly announced having bombed Havana, and the Attorney General was interested in this claim, and we conducted extensive investigation. Facts were submitted to the Department, and prosecution was not authorized, whereupon our investigation was thusly terminated. In September of 63, Wark and a companion left Florida in a rented plane, he is considered dead by other soldiers of fortune with whom he associated. Work's father is a former assistant district attorney of New York County, and he wrote to the director on 11 12 63 requesting assistance in locating his son. His letter was orally acknowledged by our New York office, and it was pointed out to Mr. Work that his son apparently disappeared while outside the limits of the United States and that our jurisdiction is confined to this country and its possessions. We have subsequently received letters from both Rourke's daughter, granddaughter, and uncle asking for our assistance in locating Rourke. In each case, 
They have been advised of our jurisdiction and the fact that we cannot be of assistance. The family of Rourke have apparently conducted extensive investigation on their own and have widely circulated both in this country and in Latin American countries a circular con concerning Rourke offering a $25,000 reward to the first person or persons to produce them in any port or city of the United States. All indications as far as view files go uh, are that Rourke is dead. We have no verified information concerning him since he left the Florida airport in September 63. Recommendation that Mr. Deloach telephonically contact Mr. Berlin and advise him in confidence of the above information and that we cannot be of help to Mrs. Rourke. And then there's a handwritten note on here. It says, no, I do not want in any way to get involved in this. Uh, Berlin might advise Billingsley or his daughter and I would be, it would be public property. Billingsley and Rourke many years ago, because would most utilize Bureau of Facilities and prevent the something. I can't read that last word. It seems like a shitty message attached to the bottom of that. So, yeah. Oh, here it is. Um, somebody typed it on this next part. Uh, the director noted, okay, so Hoover wrote that on the last one. He says, no, I do not in any way want to get involved in this. Berlin might advise Billingsley or his daughter and it would be public property. Billingsley and I broke many years ago because I would not utilize Bureau's facilities to prevent the marriage. So apparently, um, Sherman Billingsley had reached out to J. Edgar Hoover many years ago when Rourke and his, and his daughter were getting married and wanted any dirt that he had on, on Alexander Rourke, and Hoover wouldn't help him. Wow. Recommendation, then in accordance with the director's instructions, Mr. Deloach telephonically contact Mr. Berlin and advise him that we can be of no help whatsoever concerning the Alexander work matter and have a nice fucking day. No. FBI, baby. You know. Tally roll. Wow. So anyway, I thought that was some interesting stuff about uh, Alexander Rourke and his affiliations and the response from his family and their pleas and their response from, well, non-response from Johnson and a response from Hoover and uh, Carthur Deloach and the FBI's position on it that basically we're not getting involved in this. We want no part of this Alexander Rourke situation. We are done. He's dead. As far as we're concerned, have a great day. So, there's that. All right, next up we have what I would say is a very good example of what the FBI knew and when they knew it. And what I mean by that is... Hang on, let me take a sip of coffee. March the 6th, 1967. Document. Subject. Now this is going to uh, W.C. Sullivan. And on there, of course, uh, C.C. is uh, Deloach and Tolson and Hoover, yada, 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 yada. Subject, Central Intelligence Agency's intentions to send hoodlums to Cuba to, cast to assassinate Castro. Yeah. The memo states, in accordance with instructions, the tax letter has been prepared for Attorney General setting forth all data in our files concerning captioned matter. Briefly, 
information being furnished is as follows. Matter first came to our attention in spring of 1961, folks. In connection with our investigation of a violation of unauthorized publication or use of communication statute on the part of Arthur James Belletti, arrested in Las Vegas, Nevada, by local authorities on a wiretapping charge. Wiretap involved was on telephone of Dan Rowan, a member of the Rowan and Martin Laugh-In comedy team. Rowan at the time reportedly was engaged to Phyllis McGuire, a girlfriend of top hoodlum Sam Giancana and member of the McGuire Sisters singing trio. Through our investigation, we determined involvement of Robert Mayhew, a private detective who stated coverage on Rowan instituted in behalf of Central Intelligence Agency efforts to obtain Cuban intelligence data through hoodlum element, including Sam Giancana. Mayhew was in contact with Giancana through services of Johnny Rosselli, another hoodlum, and Mayhew authorized wiring of Rowan's room. We checked the matter with CIA on May 3rd, 1961, and learned CIA was utilizing Mayhew as intermediary with Sam Giancana relative to the CIA's, quote, dirty business, anti-Castro activities. CIA insisted it, it did not give Mayhew any instructions relative to use of technical installations. By letter, May 22nd, 61, we furnished former attorney General Kennedy a memorandum containing a rundown on CIA's involvement in this. The originals of the letter and memorandum were returned to us for filing purposes. A copy of that memorandum is being attached to instant letter being sent to Attorney General. On May the 9th, 1962, Kennedy discussed with the director a number of matters, including the admission by CIA that Robert Mayhew had been hired by that agency to approach Sam Giancana to have Castro assassinated at a cost of $150,000, which was a fuck ton of money in 1962. Kennedy stated he had issued orders that the CIA should never undertake such steps again without first checking with the DOJ and stated because of this matter, it would be difficult to prosecute thugs like Giancana or Mayhew then or in the future. We learned on June 20th, 63 from the CIA that its contacts with John Rosselli, Mayhew's link with Giancana, had continued up until that time when they were, were reportedly cut off. It appears Roselli is using his prior connections with the CIA to his best advantage. In May of 66, when Bureau agents endeavored to interview him, he immediately flew to Washington and informed his former CIA intermediary. Uh, the current director of security, CIA, has advised through liaison channels that Roselli has CIA in an unusually vulnerable position and Roselli would have no qualms about embarrassing the CIA to serve his own interests. In furnishing this information, we were asked that it be withheld within the Bureau on a strictly need-to-know basis. We have, however, included it in the attached proposed letter to the Attorney General, noting this CIA-specific restriction. We have two other references in our files to the overall above information which we have included in the letter. One relates to a statement by Giancana in October of 60 that he had met with an individual who was to assassinate Castro in November of 1960. The other is an article in the 816 issue uh, of the Chicago Sun-Times reporting the CIA agents had contacted Giancana to obtain Cuban intelligence. Action. If approved, attached letter will be sent to Attorney General with a copy for the Deputy Attorney General. And then there's a handwritten note on here. The Attorney General asked for this information on Friday, March the 3rd, 1967. Interesting. Interesting. Let the shit show continue. February 17th, 1967. We have another FBI uh, 
memorandum concerning David Franklin Joseph Black. Now, I'm assuming this is all one person and not two. Not David Franklin and Joseph Black, but David Franklin Joseph Black. O ye of four names. Department 703-2121-P, as in Penis Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., appeared at the Washington Field Office on February the 1st, 1967, and related a lengthy, rambling, nonspecific complaint concerning individuals he has met or become acquainted with during the past several years. He accused these unnamed individuals as being part of the communist conspiracy to capture the youth of the United States by teaching in United States schools and educational areas. Black telephonically contacted the Washington Field Office on February 7th, hey, that's my birthday, 1967, and contended he had valuable information which would enable the United States government to decipher every code system used by communist nations. However, he stated he had already spoken to a representative of the National Security Agency in reference to those matters and would not disclose same to the Federal Bureau of Investigation since this agency had no, quote, need to know. Black continued to ramble about having valuable information concerning such matters as psychological warfare utilized by communist spies in the United States, information concerning how Black Ruby was hypnotized into murdering Lee Harvey Oswald. Information concerning communist methods of financing operations in the United States through the sale of narcotics and ancient Egyptian relics. Information with reference to the recent medical operations conducted at John Hopkins University in which males were effectively transformed into females and vice versa by the use of hormones, which system was being used by communist agents in the United States in order to avoid disclosure. Information of why un unidentified flying objects had been mysteriously reported in every nation in the world, with the exception of Saudi Arabia. Hmm. Information concerning communist control of all mental institutions in the United States, and information that all radical groups operating on college campuses in the United States were formed and organized by communists to affect control of the American youth, youth, the youths. Black stated he was a member of the United States Naval Reserve, Suffolk Division, 540-M, located at the Naval Gun Factory, Washington, D.C., and had related his allegations and discoveries to his commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Eugene T. Calnan. Black also mentioned having spent a 13-hour session oh, God damn, with Agent Fox Mulder, um, with Agent Robert J. Wallman, Investigator, National Security Agency, regarding his discoveries. He was unable to provide any specific information regarding his alleged discoveries other than to say he had reached these conclusions after painstaking and thorough research. When interviewed in person on February the 1st, 1967, Black provided his birth date as April the 8th, 1945. However, during his telephone conversations on February 7th, 1967, he listed his date as July 8th, 1945. On both occasions, his place of birth was given as Brooklyn Naval Yard, Brooklyn, New York. Black furnished the following background information concerning himself. Employment. Plus Presently unemployed. Shocker. Previous employment, 1963 to 65, as a data equipment operator at the Naval Security Station National Security Agency, uh, 3801 Nebraska Avenue Northwest, with a top secret crypto clearance. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, okay. St. John's High School, Washington, D.C., 1963. U.S. Naval Academy, eight months. Dropped out for personal reasons. George Washington University and the University of Maryland. Relatives, father, deceased. Mother, presently employed by the Department of the Army at the Pentagon. Unnamed brother. Huh. Graduated from the Naval Academy in 1957. Currently assigned to the Pentagon. 
as a lieutenant commander. Black stated he is in pre presently unemployed while awaiting word from the Department of the Navy, which will enable him to begin training as a naval officer candidate in September 67. So, okay, easy to write this guy off as a fucking nut, nut job, right? What it sounds like. But then he's got all these bona fides and credentials and education and military experience, a top secret crypto clearance, and you know, a for formal education and all of his family is working in the Pentagon. Huh. Yeah. Maybe he can't be so easily dismissed. So who the hell was hypnotized Jack Ruby into killing Lee Harvey Oswald? The world will never know. Because apparently they didn't follow up on it, folks. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. Well, you never know. You never know what you're dealing with. So, well, from one alleged nut job to, to another, let's talk about James Files for a minute, shall we? Yeah, that James Files. You know, the guy who uh, admitted to being on the grassy knoll. And shooting the president in the head with a Remington fireball uh, prototype given to him by somebody at the CIA. Yeah, that James file. <laughs> so what I have here is a little, a little background, right? On uh, Mr. Files. And a couple of interviews conducted by the FBI of Mr. James Files. Here's their assessment. Files appeared to have an academic rather than personal knowledge of the Chicago outfit. It is noted that Files failed to provide knowledge of Chuck Nicoletti's affiliation with a street crew and or affiliation with other street crew members. During the interview, Files feigned familiarity, familiarity with names of individuals who were represented to him by interviewing agents as Chicago mobsters. Now, what the FBI was actually doing was asking him, you know, they were asking him, you know, if he knew certain people and they were giving, they were feeding him names. Hey, you know, this guy, you know, that guy, um, and interspersed with the real people they were asking him about. They also threw in a bunch of Italian sounding FBI agents names. Files recollections of his military career did not appear very credible. Files failed to articulate intimate recollections of airborne training. Files' recollection of his CIA recruitment during an interview was inconsistent to his statement made to attorney Don Irvin. During the interview, Files recalled that while pending discharge at Fort Meade, he was sent to Heinz VA Hospital in Maywood, Illinois, for unspecified psychological treatment. Files stated that his CIA controller signed him out of Hayes, or Heinz, sorry, but where after he assumed the controller or the, or the CIA handled his discharge. In Files' statement to Irvin, Files advised that he was recruited by the CIA after receiving a dishonorable discharge. Hines' VA records failed to show Files, a.k.a. Sutton, was ever admitted to the medical center. Files was also inconsistent in regard to his observation allegedly made at the Kennedy shooting. In Irvin's statement, Files said he saw Nicoletti shoot Kennedy. During the interview, Files backed down and said he assumed that Nicoletti had shot Kennedy. It was the opinion of interviewing agents that Files' recollections of the Kennedy assassination were also academic rather than personal. When, when asked to describe how he felt over shooting Kennedy, Files was unable to articulate any response as to his personal feelings. Chicago considers this matter as rupt, otherwise known as fucked. Now, I, I have no idea what R-U-C apostrophe D means, uh, but I'm, I'm guessing it's not good. 
as in this guy's full of shit. But they do their due diligence. Credit to the FBI. So in August of 1993, Pam Surges, a special assistant to the director of the Heinz Medical Center Vet- Veterans Administration in Maywood, Illinois, was telephonically contacted by Special Agent Wayne Zidron, wherein the following was discussed. Surges was requested to verify that a James Earl Sutton, also known as James Earl Files, date of birth, 1-24-42, ever admitted to Hines. Surges was told that Sutton said that while on active duty in the U.S. Army, he was awaiting court-martial at Fort Meade. He was sent to Hines for psychological testing for treatment. Surges was told that Sutton would likely have been admitted to Hines sometime in early 1960. Surges advised that she caused the search to be made at her agency and advised that her agency's records failed to show that a James Earl Sutton or a James Earl Files was ever admitted to Hines. Surges added that the record search encompassed that above requested time period. Surges advised that during the above time period, there were no security force at Hines, and thus Hines would not have accepted an active duty soldier who would have been ordered under confinement. Surges added that it was a rare case where Hines treated active duty personnel and that the occasion would had to have been for a specialized treatment. Surges further advised that veterans who have received a less than honorable discharge are not eligible for admission to a VA medical facility. Shocker. Files is full of shit. Clifford Smith at Correctional Center, badge number 433, at the Stateville Correctional Center of Joliet, Illinois, was interviewed wherein the following was discussed. Smith advised that James Files, Illinois Department of Correction number N14006, in it, is incarcerated in the H Wing of Stateville. Smith advised that the H Wing houses inmates under protective custody and or that have psychological disorders. Smith advised that he was unaware of Files' circumstances as to being housed in the H-Wing. Smith added that Files had requested the H-Wing. Smith rendered an op- opinion that Files, a Caucasian, opted for a protected wing rather than be subjected to certain abuse in general population, which is almost totally comprised of black or Latino inmates with street gang affiliations. Smith added that there are very few Caucasian inmates at Stateville. Smith then learned from telephone conversation with correctional officer Bino White that Files has told almost everyone that he either participated in or knows about the JFK assassination. Smith added that White related to Files as a dangerous look in his eyes. Smith recalled that White also advised that Files reads quite a bit and frequents the library. Imagine that. We were told that he, Files, wanted to make available the, quote, true story of the JFK assassination out of respect to the deceased Joe West. Agents told Files that in view of his obvious conflicts with the Warren Commission findings that he would unlikely be afforded subsequent opportunities for an interview by the FBI or the U.S. Attorney in regard to the JFK assassination unless he establishes his credibility with the government. Files was told that credibility could sometimes be established through corroboration of facts furnished by an individual during an interview. Agents told Files that the purpose of the interview was to obtain additional information from him in an effort to establish him as a credible person rather than to build a murder case on him. Files was told that the JFK assassination took place almost 30 years ago and it would take extraordinary corroboration to make recollections credible recollections credible in view of the Warren Commission finding. Agents told Files that he should decide, should he decide to answer questions, it would need to be a voluntary action on his part. Files was repeatedly told that no immunity grant or any other guarantees would be extended to him should he decide to be interviewed. In response, Files stated that he would voluntarily answer questions, but he would not to admit to any murders. 
Agents asked Files to state his true name and background. Files advised him that his true name was James Earl Sutton, but that sometime in 63, he assumed the name of James Files and has been known as James Files ever since. Files, re excuse me, Files recalled that sometime in the late 40s, he moved to the Chicago metropolitan area with his mother, Vera Brasile, and resided at 120 North 22nd Melrose Park, Illinois. Files advised that he is divorced from Faith Files, age 50, who was last known to reside in Glendale Heights, Illinois. Files stated that he had two children from his marriage, Kathleen, age 26, and Sean, age 17. Files recalled that Kathleen was last known to reside in Crystal Lake, Illinois, and Sean in Melrose Park. Agents made reference to his, Files, military service in the U.S. Army and asked Files to summarize his military career. Files recalled that he joined the U.S. Army under the last name of Sutton. He said he was afforded basic training at Fort Leonard Wood and advanced infantry training at Fort Polk. Files recalled that after AIT, he volunteered for airborne training and was afforded airborne training at both Fort Bragg and Fort Benning. Files advised that he was assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. Agents asked Files to describe his airborne training. Files recalled that airborne school was six to eight weeks in, in duration and that he had made four jumps, including one night jump. Files recalled that airborne school consisted of significant classroom instruction before he made his jumps. Files also recalled that while in airborne school, he was afforded crash courses in Chinese, Laotian, and Russian languages. When asked to recall anything eventful, either rewarding or distasteful, about airborne school, Files was unable to articulate anything in that regard. Files recalled that after airborne school, he was briefly stationed in San Diego, Okinawa, and Vietnam before being deployed to Laos. Files recollection that in Laos, he held the rank of Spec 4 and was assigned to a special advisory group. Files recalled that his group specialized in small arms, weapons, and mechanical ambushes. Agents asked Files to state details over his shooting of two U.S. soldiers in Laos. Files stated his refusal to admit to the shooting, but stated that he was charged for the shooting. Files recalled that he was afforded a preliminary court-martial somewhere in Southeast Asia and was assigned to Fort Meade, Maryland to await his court-martial. Files then recalled that he was being transferred to Heinz Veteran Hospital in Haywood, Illinois, for psychological related treatment. Files then recalled while at Hines, he was visited by, here we go, David Atlee Phillips, who identified himself as some kind of controller for the CIA. Files recalled that Phillips asked him to train people in the use of military arms and tactics. Files recalled that upon accepting Phillips' offer, Phillips signed him out of Hines. Files assumed that Phillips or the CIA handled his discharge from the Army. Files then recalled that following his release from Hines, Phillips arranged a brief stay for him at a sleazy motel in the Florida Everglades. Files recalled that from November 1960 until 61 of April, he was part of a group, 10 Americans, including Frank Sturgis, who trained a military force of 350 Cubans at that camp. Files advised that he was qualified as an expert with the M14 rifle in the Army and taught grenades and mechanical ambushes to the Cubans. Files recalled that he was, a paid, he was paid a salary of $300 a month in cash by Phillips. Files described Phillips as a white male, six feet tall, slim build, 30 years of age in 1960. Files recalled that Phillips had a nickname of the Eagle at the camp in the Florida Everglades. Files recalled that after the Cuban soldiers were killed, he, Files, went briefly to Atlanta, where he partied with liquor and women. Files then recalled that he returned to Melrose Park, Illinois, where he ran guns from Maywood, Illinois, to Clinton, Louisiana. Files recalled that the guns were 45 caliber machine guns made by the Knoxville Arms Company. Files advised that Phillips paid him $300 a month to transport guns to Clinton, Louisiana, and deliver guns to Lee Harvey Oswald. Files recalled he made several trips to Clinton, Louisiana to deliver guns to Oswald. 
Okay. Agents asked Files if the aforementioned Lee Harvey Oswald was the same one who shot Kennedy. In response, Files stated that Oswald didn't shoot Kennedy. Files adamantly disputed the fact that Oswald shot Kennedy and made reference to the fact that Oswald tested negative on a paraffin test. Agents then made reference to Chuck Nicoletti and his relationship with Chicago mobsters. In response, Files furnished agents with three pages containing numerous handwritten names. Files advised that the names were of Chicago mobsters with whom he had familiarity. Agents subsequently examined the above material and noticed that the names were arranged in alphabetical order and that most names were names of Chicago hoodlums who have been identified by the Chicago media as having association with the Chicago mob. Uh, can't make this shit up, folks. For a while, question and file some more. They asked about a lot of Chicago mafia stuff. We'll skip over here. Because the people you never heard of, I've never heard of. Agents then made reference to the JFK assassination. Files stated that Nicoletti told him that he, Nicoletti, got the contract to hit Kennedy from Sam Giancana. Files then advised that before Kennedy was shot, he, Files, at the request of Nicoletti, transported guns and hand grenades in a car from Chicago to Dallas. Files advised that he had heard Nicoletti and an individual he knew as Johnny Rosselli plan the assassination of Kennedy. Agents asked Files if he actually saw Nicoletti shoot Kennedy, and Files stated that he did not actually see Nicoletti shoot Kennedy. Files added that since Nicoletti planned the assassination and was there by the Dow Text building, he knows that Nicoletti was the one who shot him at Kennedy. Special Agent Zydron then read and verbatim to Files the following excerpt of the report previously furnished to the FBI by Attorney Don Irvin. Quote, when the motorcade came through, Files was on the knoll behind the fence and under the limbs of a tree. As Kennedy's limo approached, Files began hearing shots from behind the president. He had Kennedy's, or he had Kennedy in his telescopic sight. He knew that one of the shots had hit Kennedy in the back, but was not necessarily a fatal hit. Files, while having Kennedy in his crosshairs, as the limo was moving, said to himself upon hearing each shot, Miss, miss, miss. At this point, Files was concerned that Nicoletti would not kill Kennedy. The car was passing in his field of vision so that Mrs. Kennedy would soon be lined up behind the president. Files' instructions had always been that in a hit, no innocent parties were to be harmed. Files was afraid that if he shot any later, that he would shoot Mrs. Kennedy as well as the president. He made the decision to go ahead and shoot, even though... Uh, Chucky was still apparently shooting. He fired, and his shot hit Kennedy on the right front temple between the ear and the eye with the bullet exiting the rear of the head. At almost the same instant of this shot, Chucky hit Kennedy in the left rear top of the head. Files saw Mrs. Kennedy climb to the back of the limo and pick up a section of the president's head. He was also aware at this time that Connolly had been hit. Agents asked Files to comment about the accuracy of the statement. In response, Files expressed displeasure over Irving providing any statement to the FBI from him. Files advised that he would only admit that the statement was accurate as to the actions of Nicoletti and Roselli. Files added that he was concerned over his exposure to additional charges. Agents asked Files to explain the discrepancy contained in the above excerpt of the statement and what he said during this interview, namely that that statement indicated that he, Files, saw Nicoletti shoot at Kennedy, where during this interview, he admitted he did not actually see Nicoletti shoot Kennedy. Files did not provide an explanation in that regard. Agents asked Files if any people were near him while he openly displayed his 222 pistol with scope on the grassy Nolan Dealey Plaza. Files recalled that there were other people in the area. Agents asked Files to describe his feelings after he shot Kennedy. When Files failed to respond, agents asked if he felt good, bad, or indifferent, or even feared getting caught. Files did not provide an explanation in that regard, except for stating that he hated Kennedy for not providing air support for the Cubans in the Bay of Pigs. Agents asked Files if he would submit to a polygraph. Um, 
in regard to the Kennedy assassination. Files stated that he would refuse to take a polygraph examination. Hmm, imagine that. Agents asked Files to state his motive for revealing his knowledge of the Kennedy assassination after almost 30 years. Files stated that he was contacted by Joe West, who said he was referred to him by an unnamed FBI agent. Files recalled that West told him that an FBI agent said Files previously took him on a tour in Dallas and told him about the Kennedy assassination. Files denied talking to any FBI agent in that regard. Files added that until this interview, he could not recall having any discussions of any substance with an FBI agent. Files then advised that he wanted a grant of immunity because West had expressed his intent to subpoena him before the grand jury investigating the Kennedy assassination. Files reiterated his concern of exposure to additional charges following a possible favorable appeal to his current conviction. Agents asked Files if he had expected any consideration in exchange for his information relating to the Kennedy assassination. Files stated he did not expect or want any consideration for his information. Files stated he was not concerned if anyone ever learned about his information on the Kennedy assassination. Agents told Files that Irvin's report indicated that Files had possible information in regard to other murders. Files stated that he would not provide information that could put him put anyone in jail. Files expressed concern that the mob could retaliate against him by harming his daughters who reside in the Chicago area. Files denied that he was interviewed and or sought an interview with the media in an effort to publicize his recollections of the Kennedy assassination. At the conclusion of the interview, Files was told that agents would report the results of the interview to their headquarters. It is noted that when Files was made available for interview, he carried several items of written material. A quick review of this material revealed it to be correspondence between Files and Joe West, handwritten material in regard to the Kennedy assassination. So, he had written everything down probably that he found at the local prison library, folks. And that's why you just can't trust everybody who says they were there, who says they would take a shot, who says they knew Lee Harvey Oswald, who says they did this, who said they did that. Where is the proof? Where's the proof? And without it, all you have is a good story. And that is pretty much Wow. That was loud. Sorry. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Just a story. No meat on the bone, folks. For those of you out here who like to Propagate the James Files on the Grassy Knoll story. Please stop. Just stop. Please stop. You know, when you see a guy like I did in 2019, when you see an old guy with messy white hair in a shabby looking jacket wandering around the Grassy Knoll asking people, you know who I am? Just stay away. You know, if this guy was half of the person that he says that he was, just saying. Anyway, that's it for this week. Follow along on Twitter at the Lone Gummin Seven, on TikTok at the Lone Gummin Seven, on YouTube, search for the Lone Gummin Podcast, and on Facebook, search for the Lone Gummin Podcast, and make sure you are checking out Quick Hits a news and notes podcast on the JFK assassination that I do with my buddy Doug. Make sure you're checking it out. Damn it. Like, share, learn, reveal. It's your boy, Big Bad Bobby. Out. Tell him, Roger.